we're lucky to uh, have Catherine Bihar, who is a an artist working and living in Brooklyn. Sorry, let's get this up. And um, uh, you know what's interesting always the art world's a really small place. I don't know if you guys know this, but so what that means is that you cross people's paths and you're not necessarily aware that you actually have done that, right? And today we were playing that game, and it turned out that we'd cross paths through three or four different vectors, right? Three or four different people. So uh, Catherine's videos, performance, and interactive installations explore issues in contemporary digital culture. Her interdisciplinary work has been presented at festivals, galleries, performance spaces, screenings, and art centers in Europe and North America. She is based in New York and is assistant professor of new media arts at Baruch College. She also just opened a show at the Para Museum in Istanbul which is a pretty cool thing. So without further ado, we're lucky to have, please welcome, Catherine Bihar. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna put this keyboard away. Okay, here we go. Um, thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing more of the work that's happening here um, at William Patterson. And um, thanks especially to Michael for the invitation to come and visit with you guys today. Um, as Michael mentioned, I have just um, opened a museum survey show of my work. It's called Catherine Behar Data's Entry. And it's at the Para Museum in Istanbul. And this was really a project that is something that I've been developing, as you can imagine, over uh, many months. And it's been a way for me to sort of recontextualize and think anew about, um, about my work and look at different kinds of um, through lines through various different projects that I've been doing over the past several years. So the talk that I'm going to give um, today, it's called Optimized, Not Optimistic. And um, it's really framed around that show. So I'll be talking with you both about some of the ideas behind the show and, um, of course, the works in the show and the sort of process of making these works. Um, and I'm going to be going back and forth between um, showing you some images and showing you some videos and reading a little bit. I'm aiming to talk for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions and stuff at the end. Okay? So um, without further ado, um, here's, a, here's a view of that show. Um, so my work concerns gender and labor in digital culture, and I move really fluidly between making art and video and sculpture and insta interactive installations and performance and writing. So as we go along, I'm going to be showing you how my works are embodying two main theoretical interventions that I've been working on, and that's both in my artwork and also in my writing. The first one is called Object-Oriented Feminism, or OOF for short, um, which is the subject of my new edited collection that is going to be coming out um, actually just in a couple of weeks now from University of Minnesota Press. And I've got actually some flyers here. Maybe I'll send these around. Um, folks are interested. Mina. Thank you. So um, please go ahead and take one, order the book. You can pre-order on Amazon already. Um, and the second one is what I'm going to call, so that's on the left. The, on the right is um, what I'm calling decelerationist aesthetics. And this book, Bigger Than You, Big Data and Obesity, is the first um, sort of inquiry toward that idea. But it's a theme that I've been dealing with in my work for many, many years. And um, it's an ongoing investigation that I'm also currently working on. So, I've titled this talk, Optimized, Not Optimistic. And what do I mean by this phrase? I believe that as a result of the digital, and specifically as a result of our reliance on data, our culture is getting increasingly optimized. That is to say that we are more efficient, more productive, more standardized, more integrated, more routinized, and more automated than ever before. Yet I feel that this optimization is not necessarily cause for optimism. Why? Because optimization always incurs a serious burden that people, machines, and our environment must all share. 
So this is a central concern throughout my work, and in many of the pieces in data's entry, I'm attempting to show the burden of optimization as a physical weight that the body must bear. Capitalist contexts most often motivate our optimization efforts. So I focus on optimization in performances of labor. Work is a recurring theme, and the notion of performing work is a way that all of my projects that I'm going to be showing you revolve around performance in some way, even when I'm employing different kinds of media. So the lens of performance art also foregrounds weight, both the physical load of objects and the metaphoric loadedness of optimization. So I'd like to begin by sharing with you three of the new works that I created for the Istanbul exhibition, because each of them is exploring this idea of weight in a different way. The first work, Data Cloud, A Heap, A Mass, A Rock, A Hill, is a QWERTY keyboard sculpture that was inspired by the etymology of the words data and cloud. Data Cloud presents a malleable mound of glistening keyboard keys that slumps heavily to the touch. The word data first appeared in the English language in the phrase a heap of data in, uh, sorry, in 1646, not 1946, 1646. I learned about the word cloud when a friend forwarded me a word of the day tweet from the Oxford English Dictionary. Cloud dates to 9th century Old English when spelled clud, kind of like a clod, it meant a mass of rock or a hill. So today we imagine cloud computing and data as being immaterial, but data cloud, a heap, a mass, a rock, a hill, renders them physically as a mound of keyboard keys. To make this imagined lumpen interface, I attached over 6,000 reclaimed keyboard keys, one by one, with each key representing for me a singular input point or datum. En masse, they take on an analog dimension, becoming weighty, unwieldy, grounded, and importantly, senseless. The word data means simply the raw measurement of the world. The difference then between data and information is that data is just the numbers, unordered, before they get processed into meaningful information. I think of this heap of, as a pile of meaningless measure that takes on a certain weight. There is no meaning in this heap of data, only unordered, uninterpretable, symbolic bits. The scale of this interface defies human inter intention. I'm very interested in this precognitive aspect of data and of objects in general. If we can focus on matter rather than meaning, we can open ourselves to embodied, sympathetic, or affective relationships with other objects, rather than subjecting them, pun intended, to knowledge practices that only make sense on the productivist basis of human subjecthood. The next work that I'd like to share with you is a related project. It is the title work in the Istanbul exhibition, and it's a new performance called Data's Entry. So here are some images of the piece. In the performance Data's Entry, a performer must interact with an impossible interface covered in QWERTY keyboard keys. Again, my symbol for data input. It's shaped like an overgrown capsule, something meant to enter the body, but the body is always confronted with it as an unworkable external surface, an object that's too big to swallow or hold in the hand. As the dancers slowly explore the affordances and constraints of this object as interface and create new relationships with it, we find that its scale confounds their efforts and they are in a constant process of negotiation with this alien object. For me, the meaning of the title, Data's Entry, is that data reflects our bodies and data has entered in our world as a presence we must contend with, as though it has a body of its own. Ironically, we know this in our bodily guts when data presses us into grueling repetitive tasks like data entry, and we find ourselves resisting. One main theme running throughout my work is the push and pull between our experience of organic human bodies 
and our idealized dreams of inorganic machinic systems. My work takes the approach of returning our focus to the laboring body, which confronts the tensions of optimization in settings of work, where human and non-human bodies collide in ways that are confounding and sometimes rebellious. My work involves not just the human body, but also the robotic body of the machine, the absent or missing human, and the transhuman body of, of automation. In data's entry, the performers move excruciatingly slowly to make the effort of work visible in their bodies. I'm influenced by the decelerated performance style of Japanese Buto, as well as by choreographers like Jerome Bell or the Judson Church movement, who have explored exhaustion, effort, and physical uh, and pedestrian movement to counter the weightless, supposedly weightless virtuosity of classical dance. This performance and the exhibition as a whole aim to expose how being pressed into the service of a technology weighs us down. Throughout my work, I attempt to undermine the myth of homo faber, or man the toolmaker. Here he is, that's homo faber. So in science-driven cultures like ours, this myth is used to explain what makes us human. We are taught to believe that humans are special because we uniquely create tools to bend the world to our purposes. Of course, we also know that this is not true. Animals also use tools, for example. But perhaps I want to suggest it is also the other way around. In our entanglements with tools, we serve them too. This connection to non-anthropocentrism a central theme that I promote in my theoretical work in object-oriented feminism, as well as in my artwork. Non-anthropocentrism means simply the belief that humans are not the most central entity in the universe. Anthropocentrism is the kind of hubristic human exceptionalism that follows from Homo faber and has led humans to engage with the non-human world in an exploitative way, resulting in all manner of crises from ecological devastation to war. Instead, and in keeping with non-anthropocentrism's more modest stance, object-oriented feminism finds traces of traditional gender, racial, and class dynamics in relationships not only between people where we would expect to find them, but also with and between things. Against the backdrop of universally laboring bodies, my work elicits human-non-human solidarities on the basis of this kind of commonality. What I mean by this, human-non-human solidarities, is respectful, collaborative, non-exploitative engagements with objects, a way of relating to objects with a form of decelerated detachment rather than utilitarian tool thinking. This is related to the Jainist concept of ahimsa, and I've characterized my thinking around this notion as both care as neglect and neglect as care. People often ask me whether I think that robots and AIs pose a threat to humanity, but I think that this anxiety is sorely misplaced. It assumes that the core relationship between humanity and everything else in the world is adversarial and competitive, but that's not the only possible kind of relationship that we might have. I'm interested in fomenting human-non-human -human camaraderie, a goal that is very much aligned with and even inspired by feminist ideologies. Data cloud and data's entry are familiar but strange, not unlike the QWERTY keyboard itself, which was designed to be just unfamiliar enough to slow down the process of rapid typing, which tangled the keys of early typewriters, confounding typists who were too quick with the more intuitive alphabetic layout. Here is an, an image of another early typing interface, the Molling Hansen writing ball that was used by Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche dreamed of a transparent interface, a machine that would directly transcribe his thoughts, and he hoped that the writing ball was going to be that machine for him. 
Nietzsche was going blind, so he learned touch typing in order to be able to continue to write his philosophy without having to rely on his failing eyes. But as media historian Friedrich Hitler tells the story, Nietzsche soon discovered that the writing ball was not the transparent interface he had hoped for after all. Changing how he wrote changed what he wrote. Once he started typing, Nietzsche's writing became much shorter, more telegraphic, and more aphoristic. He confessed, quote, our writing tools are also working on our thoughts. Like Nietzsche and like the data's entry performers negotiating their capsule, we experience the same thing when we try to condense and accelerate our thoughts, for example, into 140 characters on Twitter. The next project that I'd like to show is an another new work that was created for data's entry. It's called Data, uh, oh, sorry, it's called Cloud Profiles Weightless Measures, and it's a 3D animation site-specific intervention that temporary ocu temporarily occupies four of the video screens in the Para Museum's Anatolian Weights and Measures Collection Gallery. So when I was first learning about this museum, I found, about, I found out about its impressive collection of Anatolian weights and measures. And this seemed to be a natural fit for a new project that at the time I was really just beginning to think about, extending my previous work on big data and taking on this issue of cloud computing. Like data's entry and data cloud, this project seeks to debunk the fantasy of cloud computing as being weightless and immaterial. So even though metaphors like the cloud would suggest otherwise, I wanted to show how data too has weight. To create these animations, I started by scanning a human performer who is then represented in two non-human forms, both as a cloud of digital data and as a material artifact with stone and metal textures that are inspired by the objects in the collection. So I'll play one of these short videos while I talk. Data acts as a powerful technological commodity, but in my view, it is even more important to understand this other role of data as a universal measure. As a measure, data is especially evocative for me because it is becoming a great leveler of the differences that traditionally separate humans from machines. I'm interested in how this aspect of data is a contemporary manifestation of the same universal standards that begin with weights and measures. The idea of weights and measures is that value translates and transfers. A dirham here is a dirham there. A gram here is a gram there. But today, these standards seem to have lost their weightiness, which is something that I hope that my work is helping to restore. While I was in Istanbul, I had an incredible opportunity to visit the collection and experience the weight of standardization literally firsthand. So here's the collection, or here's some of the collection. Um, and I actually was able to hold some of these objects and feel their weight in my hands. This is a somatic experience that's impossible to have with the newer standard of digital data, which seems to be everywhere and nowhere at once. Now, what is meaningful to me about the presence of data in our lives is the ways that we are optimized through data. And that is the universal aspect of data. The idea that everything can be digitized or rendered as data which is what connects to this, this collection of weights and measures. These weights and are beautiful sculptural objects, like this fish weight, that, um, but even more fascinating to me, they are also social objects. This is a duck weight that is over 4,000 years old. If we think back to weights and measures, these artifacts promise that we can live in an organized and just society because we are able to use the same standards universally. In other words, if everything can be counted, we can count on each other. I believe that data offers an updated version of this promise, but one that's so extreme that it starts to border on something less like a promise and more like a threat. If everything can be counted, 
And if we are united as both the counters and the counted, then here's the question. What is left to distinguish between the data that constitutes me and the data that constitutes the world? This sounds like a rather abstract philosophical question, and it is indeed something that we grapple with in OOF, but it's very important for understanding the dynamics that are reordering our world today. To take the example of data and identity, delineations between self and other may waver or get radically remixed. We see that in the wavering, clouded forms of these figures. Or to take the example of data and memory, we think that if we save something to disk, or better yet, to the cloud, it will exist there as a reference forever. Of course, we have all experienced the heartbreaking betrayal of failed hard drives and unreliable cloud service. So we know that's actually not true. But data doesn't only affect memory around the past and storage. Its most powerful aspect may be its predictive capacities. As the saying goes, the internet never forgets. But much more importantly, networked data can be mined in multiple directions at once. This makes the present only one possibility, contingent on many futures. Actualized or not, predictive futures quote unquote stored no differently than memories of past events in the cloud. So this is not merely a philosophical consideration. There are real applications like predictive policing and risk management in which we see data's forecasting capacity applied toward capitalist social control. These objects are canceled weights that were not perfectly standard, so they were decommissioned and taken out of circulation. I think of them as being broken bits or a discontinuous future rendered obsolete in its own time. And these are some of my favorite objects in the collection. These are called make weights, which are weights that were not up to standard, so the added material, these kind of like barnacle-like forms, blobs basically of metal, the added material, is, which is really an irregularity, is necessary in order to make them regular. Paradoxically, what makes them unique is also what makes them standard. Dan Rosenberg writes about this in his catalog essay as hepex legomenon, which means said once in Greek, and which he sees as the metaphor for all of my work. He writes, quote, one might see Behar's creations as hapaxes, as an individual, the hapax ligamenon exists at the feathery edge of data. It is the inverse image of the durum, which, unique as it may be in any instance, is meant in essence to own, always be the same. So the next piece that I'd like to share is a robotic performance that also highlights seemingly organic irregularity and idiosyncrasies. Roomba Roomba presents a pair of robotic vacuums with potted rubber trees strapped to their backs, dancing to a karaoke backing track for High Hopes, a children's song made famous by Frank Sinatra. Roombas are intelligent robotic vacuums that learn how to navigate the space that they're in to clean it effectively. Paired with the music, their algorithmic movements look choreographed and charismatic. When human audience members are in the space, their bodies change the room's contours. So the Roombas investigate, giving us the impression that they are alive, flirtatious, and social. Here is a short video of this interaction.
Okay. <laughs> so, Rumba Rumba pivots on these kinds of solidarities that I was talking about between artificial and biological, um, natural and machinic, behind the scenes service work and performative display. The song's hero is a little old ant who is a worker who manages to move a rubber tree plant through irrational aspiration, high hopes, and hard labor. The cheerful song and the notion that plants and machines are dancing and behaving socially um, seem playful, but r the Roomba's performance also carries a darker message. The song High Hopes teaches children to overcome adversity by working as hard as they possibly can. Today, these traits make for prime neoliberal subjects. The ant has long been a symbol of the worker, and in Rumba Rumba, the ant is recast as an even more perfect worker, a machine. In previous works, I have tried to perform a non-human machines process, but in Rumba Rumba, the machine performs what is traditionally human's work, the gendered activity of vacuuming. Going back to this notion of human-non-human -human solidarities, this project makes an important case for the continuities between women's work and the robotic work of machines, both of which are often black boxed or hidden from view. Whether performed by humans or machines, computer work, service work, and domestic work all share this kind of cultural invisibility. I'm not only interested in making labor itself visible, but also in making visible that commonality as grounds for transhuman solidarities. In fact, before computers were computers, computers were women. In the 1940s, a computer wasn't a thing, it was a job. So computers were people who performed computation. Bakers bake, teachers teach, computers compute. Computing was monotonous number crunching, a form of clerical work that was usually done by women, both because there were more women available to work during World War II, and because of cultural assumptions that women were more suited to this kind of mindless tedium, much like data entry. In fact, women were considered ideal computers from as early as the late 18th century. So this slide shows women computers working on tabulating data, here are two women computers working on the ENIAC machine, which was the first general purpose electronic computer. And this incredible image shows a male programmer issuing commands to a female computer. And this is very persistent imagery that we see again in updated form, for example, in the 2013 Spike Jones movie, Her. My work recognizes this material historical connection between working bodies and the computer. Because one of the things that I am most concerned with is the labor required for techno-social processes that uphold digital culture to run. What these images show is that there is a direct feminist concern in the link between the invisible black boxed labor of the machine and the invisibility of women's work. So in addition to a feminist critique of technology, with Rumba Rumba, I'm also critiquing the modernist colonial enterprise, and specifically slavery, as a supply mechanism to provide labor power. I consider how contemporary digital tools and gadgets are robots in the etymological sense, meaning forced labor. This is RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, a play by Carol Chapek, which coined the term robot from a Czech root, robota, meaning forced labor, serf labor, or servitude. A common complaint of digital culture is to say, we are slaves to the machine. But I'm also interested in at looking at how machines are slaves to us, and what that says about human ethics, especially as we humanize them in films like her. When I presented an early version of the Roomba project at the University of Michigan, a student, Eliza Cadeau, gave a brilliant response to the project using the rubber tree as a point of departure. 
and the rubber treat reminded her of cruel labor practices in Congolese rubber plantations. Belgian colonialists would cut off the hands of underproductive workers so as to force the most productive workers to work doubly hard to support their kin network. Cadu drew a connection between this form of slave labor and the dream of optimized hand, hands-free labor sublimated today in the Roomba, which in this piece nevertheless bears the rubber tree as a burden. In fact, the conditions for optimized and automated labor show how humans and machines are united in work requiring each other's support and opening possibilities for new forms of solidarity. For example, here is an image of the famous mechanical Turk automaton. The automaton was supposed to play chess on its own, but it actually required a human hiding inside to work on its behalf. Today, I'm very interested in how far we are from effective artificial intelligence and other forms of automation. The gaping disparities in AI systems are further proof of why solidarities with machines might not be such a crazy idea after all. A recent example of this is the personal assistant AIs that give users the experience of automation, when in fact, like the mechanical Turk, the so-called AI is a group of real people desperately scrambling behind the scenes to maintain app-like real-time efficiency. Platforms like GoButler, Clara, and XAI were intended to be actual AIs, but the technology just wasn't good enough, so they had to hire humans to fill in. I explored a similar idea in my 2007 performance, this is not in the Data's Entry exhibition, called Live Chatter, Impersonal Impersonation of a Chatterbot pers Persona. Chatterbots are AIs that pretend to be human by mimicking conversation. And in this telephone present performance conducted over Skype, I flipped that logic and pretended to be an AI who was learning about feminist theory by listening in on network traffic at a feminist um, technology conference and mimicking chat language. In the process, the chatterbot discusses philosophies of passing and artificiality, or what it means to be artificial intelligence, designed simply to pass. And of course, we should remember that the original Turing test was meant to interrogate for gender, not intelligence. Amazon's mechanical Turk labor market, named for the automaton, uses a similar inverted logic by hiring humans at micro wages to complete what are called human intelligence tasks, or HITs, that machine intelligence still isn't that great at handling. I find these examples from the realm of labor to be especially fascinating because they make a great argument for the kind of solidarity that I'm advocating. Robots are not so efficient that they are stealing people's jobs. Robots are so inefficient that they are forcing people to work as robots. This is something that I think that so-called accelerationist theorists are dangerously naive about when they advocate for automation as a supposed end of work. The title and tagline of a Bloomberg technology article about the personal assistant AIs says it all. The humans hiding behind the chat box, behind the artificial intelligence personal assistants and concierges are actual people reading emails and ordering Chipotle. So this is a clear cut example of how optimization creates an added burden shared all around. The next project that I'd like to show is an installation called eWaste. It's a series of sculptures built from commonplace USB peripherals. Lorraine Rudin, a collaborator who has known my work for many years, once wisely described my aesthetic as neither new media nor old media, but middle-aged media. As she pointed out, most of the technologies that I'm drawn to in my work are things that are not necessarily obsolete, but that are probably headed in that direction. These are things that exist now, but are perhaps something that a mom might use. For example, today's QWERTY keyboards may soon be eclipsed by touchscreens as we more and more frequently conduct our computing on smartphones. So these cycles of obsolescence inspired e-waste. The point of, de of departure for the installation is a science fictional scenario. 
plastic USB devices have survived an ecological apocalypse. Although they no longer have humans to program them, they are destined to work forever. Even as their bodies become slowly fossilized, they keep churning. So this piece is called Prologue, and this is a special bilingual edition that we created for this show. I'll read you the text to give you a sense of the narrative behind this installation. The factories finally grow so large that the planet can no longer support their weight. It starts with a simple sinkhole in Shenzhen. Eroded beaches pile onto deforested mountainsides. Slums crumble over condos, sloshed in ice cap runoff, and the continent slips. It isn't long before neighboring nuclear reactors are swallowed and the inevitable rest is history. Soon, Earth is no longer habitable for humans. But what of all the gadgets those factories churned out, the always-on armies that once served the human race? Their plastic bodies prove impervious to eventual climate change and sudden catastrophe. Indeed, they hastened this. But without humans to program them, to direct their work and give them purpose, the devices persist in their empty routines. As years go by, the earth beneath them takes pity. The stony ground creeps toward the orphaned gadgets, embracing their fragile frames to soothe and brace them for their burden of infinite work. E-Waste connects with several key themes in my work. One is the seeming purposelessness of our empty productivity and hollow habits. E-Waste makes clear that the dark flip side of optimization and overproduction is the constant threat of disposability. To be sure, we are not only optimizing our machines, we are optimizing ourselves as well. In many ways, optimization amounts to narrowing the ontological gap between Homo faber and his tools. Optimization makes ourselves and our machines more compatible in order that all things, human and non-human alike, can function seeming, seamlessly in overarching total systems. These optimized systems operate without distinguishing between components, biological or technical, human or non-human, organic or machinic. This means we need to ask, what are we optimizing ourselves for? I'm a consumer and I certainly desire new technologies, but as I get older, I more and more frequently find myself dreading the upgrade. I'm exhausted by the process of obsolescence because it requires not only upgrading the technology, but also upgrading myself. With every new update, I too must be updated. I am compelled to, to learn new skills, master a new system, and cultivate new habits when I'm not necessarily ready to give up the old ones yet. For example, I passively aggressively tell software updates, we were discussing this at lunch, to remind me later for weeks at a time. I'm doing this right now with my iPhone, which I refuse to plug in at night because I don't want it to update in my sleep. Perhaps this procrastination is an outgrowth of my work in decelerationist aesthetics. I use this term in my work to talk about ways that form, in an aesthetic sense of the word, helps us to decelerate the compulsive and compulsory cycles of overproduction, consumption, and obsolescence that we all participate in, like it or not. E-waste puts the focus on digital cast-offs, the casualties of upgrade culture that didn't make the cut or got used for a while and tossed aside. I want to solicit sympathy for these gadgets because I see humans as being in an analogously precarious role. Just like a gadget with a singular function, many people who are trained for specialized work or limited by structural forces are cast aside and replaced when their jobs are no longer desired. All of this is to say that as quickly as we are depleting the environment, which is a very real concern, I worry that we are also depleting ourselves, and these are two symptoms of the same problem. The media theorist Willem Flusser once wrote, quote, 
the human hand consumes culture and transforms it into waste. The human being is surrounded not by two worlds then, but by three, of culture, of nature, and of waste. It is a cycle turning from nature to culture, from culture to waste, from waste to culture, and so on, a vicious cycle. In e-waste and in the next project that I'd like to share, 3D and and, I'm interested in how this cyclical malleability of categories undermines human intentionality. I think that there are parallels between the contemporary compulsion to work 24-7 that's exacerbated with things like social media where we ourselves are always on, and the idea that like these devices and like earlier robotic and colonial slaves, humans are disposable in a global digital economy of this scale. So 3D and and is a fossilized 3D printer that slowly and diligently produces scarab covers for a network of glowing USB mouses. This piece crosses the archeological and futuristic, digital and handcrafted reproduction and animate and inanimate agency. I like to think that this piece gives us different approaches for thinking about time, which is another major theme of these works related to decelerationist aesthetics. On one level, 3D and and is drawing a line through time, connecting the deep past and the distant future. I designed the scarab to reference an archeological object like Egyptian artifacts from the ancient past. Yet when reproduced by the printer performing as another robot in the gallery, these scarabs take on a futuristic quality, gleaming in the light of the mouse's twinkling LEDs. And because they can be reproduced endlessly, they call to question the notion of any origin point. The final scarabs even reference the absence of the human hand in that the sectional patterns of the 3D printer's layered excretions start to look like the arches, whorls, and loops of a human fingerprint. While the printer works, its motors call out a pathetic message, mommy, daddy, M-O-M-M-Y, D-A-D-D-Y in Morse code. They are perfect um, futuristic digital copies of an imperfect handmade model from a forgotten age, an artifact without an origin. On another level, the decelerationist aspect of 3D and and affirms our present as we become engrossed in watching the printer's slow work. Time stands still while the printer works at a painstaking rate, defeating the promises of supposed rapid prototyping. So here's a short video to show this process. The next piece that I'd like to show is a video series called Modeling Big Data. And this is a six channel video installation in which I parody how computer culture favors hoarding over production and excess. I perform as an obese data body, so stuck in the cycle of generating data that like so-called big data, it has become swollen by its own data glut. I repeat an endless series of movements that are comically inadequate attempts for me to mimic common computer routines. I call these data gestures, and they are clicking, buffering, caching, and pinging. So I'll play one of the videos now. This is clicks, and it's just under two minutes.
So just as e-waste critiques the overproduction of consumer tech gadgets, modeling big data focuses on the overproduction of personally identifiable data. When such information is data mined, it can be construed as a portrait of an individual, but a special kind of data profile that can be predictively, probabilistically forecast. In this way of thinking, um, and thinking back to the idea that Nietzsche's keyboard changed his writing and his thinking, I believe that the much-hyped phenomenon of big data is changing our sense of self. The overproduced profiles become bloated beyond recognition, becoming the excess weight of the figure itself. So there's two red and two gray scenes in this series. The red ones are clicks and buffering, and they represent front-end data gestures that users experience. And the gray ones, cached and pings, represent back-end um, data gestures that are typically hidden from experience. Most people see these and they think that this is a computer-generated um, animation. But actually, I produced these using extremely low-tech uh, means. So this is all made with a combination of paper, foam, and myself as a performer inside of these obese forms. Perhaps the opposite, this will be the last one that I show then. So perhaps the opposite of humans being drawn into cycles of compulsory productivity is this next piece. It's a single channel video called autoresponder.exe. In this piece, I was inspired by email auto replies which we've all, if not used, then certainly received. Autoresponders are automated, automated email scripts that send generic reply messages to incoming mail in lieu of a personally composed response. So these messages typically say things like, sorry, I'm out of the office, or I'm away from my desk, or some other excuse. They give the illusion that a human is replying when in fact it's just a programmed script. So you're looking at the final image of the video, and I'll play a portion of it now. The video is 16 minutes, so this is just a section um, from the middle. This is what happens. It just scans slowly. So the video compares a scene of managerial power to this type of software that is impersonal, ineffective, and tone deaf. The image slowly scans, revealing a still photograph of an executive desk standing on end in a disheveled office. Like bureaucracy itself, auto-response messages provide a shallow veneer of competence in corporate culture. They mask inattention, lapsed productivity, and bureaucratic redundancy. Although this is a high-resolution 4K video, which uses some of the latest video technology available, the video is very slow, and the image is revealed line by line, evoking primitive email load times for JPEGs back in the day. The image itself contains a dense iconography for masculinity and tropes of patriarchal power. So I'll conclude. Engineering missteps and design faux pas 
clog the arteries, litter the hallways, and cram the circuits of commercial desire. It is easy enough to despise the digital dross of so much junk culture, but insofar as we reflect ourselves in the products we create and love to hate, fabricating new technologies to overcome our human limitations, and retrofitting ourselves to accommodate their inevitable shortcomings, we engage in a cycle of mutual imprinting. And so we must ask, as we code ourselves into technology, bit for bit. What becomes of the ugly bits? Are they augmented along with the rest? One such ugly bit lurking in the dynamic of user tool servitude is the possibility that our distaste masks residual class prejudice. Are not digital tools the inanimate, ununionized, exploited working class of global capitalist production? Programmed to perform uncomplainingly in always-on 24-7 work weeks, today's software and hardware legions carry out the modernist dream of robotic forced labor. High obsolescence rates betray our disregard for these machines, which in another world we might know as companion species. Though we are eager to accept their servitude, we are quick to discard them for a faster, stronger, newer model. Have we expanded slavery and its disposable corpus of mass labor into the object world? These would be questions for science fiction. Were it not for commercial cycles, unprecedented acceleration, which does not only collapse production and consumption, or merely garble labor and leisure. Today, there are no longer clear divisions between producer and product. When self is a product of media and consumed as media, we can see how our own selves as media are ripe for exploitation too, through digital profiling, tracking, tagging, etc. When we too are media, the imperative to inculcate care for consumer technologies sounds only half funny. Thank you. Oh. Test, test, one, two, test. Anybody have any questions? Um, let me just think about how to phrase this for sure. a second. Um, so do you completely conceptualize your work before you make it? all the time because I find that very, I can't imagine doing that, but it seems like that's what you're doing. That's such a good question. And actually that's a question no one has ever asked me before. Um, the answer is no. I am usually, I have some ideas and I start making and then the ideas change while I'm making. You know, so often this is through, I mean, okay, to take an example of, um, the data cloud sculpture that I sh showed that's like this big mound of keyboard keys. The idea for that changed so many times, right? And actually, when I was first thinking about it, I initially thought that I was going to be making these sculptures where they were actually kind of the process was going to start with what ended up becoming the animations for cloud profiles, where I was going to be 3D scanning, a performer and an object that was going to look kind of like the cloud. And then I realized that the object was not, it wasn't giving me the look that I wanted. The object was sort of too big. I decided that instead I wanted to have appendages for like costume parts on the, um, on the performer. So that became one piece. And then I still had this leftover idea of this big malleable form of the cloud. And I started thinking about what that would look like. And I actually ended up going back to an early work that I did when I was still in grad school, um, a performance called Hexed, where I had made a costume out of keyboard keys. And I thought, okay, actually that's the texture that I want to have on this sculpture, which I thought was gonna be made out of my initial, one of my initial ideas, I don't even know what was the first idea, but one of the ideas was that I was gonna have basically the negative space of a body interacting with the cloud. I would take away the body and have the negative space with this cloud, and that was going to be some kind of hard 
material in the end, and it turned out to be something totally different. So a lot of this is stuff that is sort of happening as a result of, you know, well, many factors, like whatever the ideas are I'm thinking about, whatever the, um, the process is that I'm working with, um, whatever, you know, resources I have to accomplish these ideas. So it's really always changing. Okay. Thank yeah. You. While you're running over, I would also just add that because a lot of my work takes a long time to make, it gives me a lot of time to think more, right? Because I'm, I'm, I have a lot of time in the studio doing things like putting individual keyboard <laughs> keys on something, right? So it gives me a lot of time to think about the ideas and refine them more. Go ahead. So that second to last thing you showed us, you said that was you? Yes. <laughs> How uncomfortable were you in that? How what? How uncomfortable were you How in that? How uncomfortable was I? Um, so I have a background in performance art. My undergrad was in performance art. So I am used to doing all kinds of really weird, uncomfortable things. <laughs> so in some ways, um, one thing that was nice about working with, um, that in general is nice about working with video is like sometimes you can take a break, whereas if you're performing some kind of weird durational performance, Got to see it through. So that was um, a project I actually shot in two parts. Um, the red scenes I shot first. Um, this is also an example of like a long process where I'm developing the ideas. The red scenes I shot first, um, and then I sort of developed the idea further and shot the gray scenes later. Um, the red scenes I, I had a different, at that point I had kind of a different idea for what I was thinking I was going to do, and it was a very long and involved shoot. The gray scenes were much easier to do because I knew at that point exactly what I wanted. Okay. Yeah. Any other it's a little toasty in there. <laughs> so I think one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, a couple of questions come to mind, but maybe even a question for the audience, is how aware people are of these uh, mechanisms or the mm -hmm. structure of media that you're bringing out. Mm. Uh, in your experience, the typical museum viewer, do you mm. find them educated to these things, to the issues of digital media and labor? Or do you find yeah. that it's a little invisible to them? I think, you know, it's interesting. And I think, you know, part of this is because I'm working with these kind of the middle brow, the middle aged or middle brow technologies that I've talked about. Um, I find that people are more aware than I would have necessarily expected because these are such familiar objects. And I think, you know, there's enough in, um, in mainstream media about, I mean, about tracking, about, I mean, the NSA, about, you know, what have you. So there's already a little hint of paranoia from, I think, the news and from, um, you know, Hollywood, basically, right? Um, and I think that when people have these devices, it's sort of, you know, they're personal devices. They're things that everyone is kind of familiar with on some level. They seem, it's like something you would have in your home. And people are, you know, they're, they're very willing to go there. Yeah. They might they're, not necessarily. Everyone has one, but also there's my iPhone and then there's your yeah. iPhone. And mm -hmm. when they get mixed up or even that sense of ownership, like, yeah. wait, 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 that's mine. That's yeah, mine. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, don't look or don't open or, you know, yeah. no, you can't use that. You can't. Yeah. That kind yeah. Of thing. Well, this is like the difference, I think, between the personal device and social media, right? It's like, and we are accessing social media through our personal devices. So it's a very muddy uh, condition. And people get. I think the kind of exhaustion that begins to happen when you op have to open a program, you have to log on. You, I mean, in a, in a sense, it's nothing. And, and right. that's how it was sold to us. This is trivial. You, right. But then you've done it f a thousand times. Exactly. Or 3,000 times. Exactly. You're exhausted with it. You mm -hmm. don't ever want to do it again, so on and so forth. And yet, you continue to, you continue to log on to Facebook. You continue to go into Instagram. Right. Well, let me look. I'm sick of looking. Let me look again. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And those are the kinds Absolutely. of labor, you know, yes. entrainment yeah. Yeah. that begins to happen. Yeah. And yeah. are maybe clues. It's like the right. glitch in the matrix, right? Those are the little, uh, you know. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. I don't really want to be there. Yeah. You know? But I think also, you know, what is, I mean, I would say not only the average museum goer, but I would put myself in this category that, um, one of the things that um, 
that is really creepy to me is not only so we're exhausted. A, we're exhausted, and B, we know better. Right. Like we know what Facebook is doing, <laughs> right? We know that this is like not in our best interest, right. and we're still doing it. Right. I use Facebook. I'm like lying in bed before I fall asleep on Facebook. I wake up in the morning, I'm on Facebook. Like, so we, I do it anyway. And I think that that's really, like this is where, um, you know, these devices are changing our behaviors, our habits, our like, like the things that are like our most intimate moments are all well, mediated through. You, know, the, you spoke about it, mm -hmm. but, but there's, there's this whole cognitive marketing mm. thing that people do. Mm. And it's profound that they can tell what kind of peanut butter you like and how you like to eat the peanut butter. There's certain things that are remote from them that they right. can't tell about, right. but they can tell this from your, from your, right. the data body that surrounds right. you. Right. And, um, and so, of course, they're trying to predict what you will and won't buy and how you will and won't buy it yeah. and all that stuff. And they even can predict your um, inconsistency. Yes. Yes. Which is just like it's amazing. No! Yeah, it's amazing. It's yeah, not it's what yeah, be yeah, yeah. And it's so you know, and then other uh, proposals. Say, Jaron Lanier came up mm -hmm. with one, which was had been around. It, well, he didn't invent it. About the idea that I would share in the use of my data body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Was you know, I mean, yeah. I s sort of passed over. Yeah. wasn't taken seriously yeah. in any way. Yeah. I mean, I think he really put something out there and tried I, yeah, to Yeah, no, I think it's a serious idea. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, but yeah. no one picked it up, and particularly not the Silicon Valley people, because let's face it, they want to be Mark Zuckerberg. They want to be the billionaire that cures d disease, you know? And then they used all of their charities in, a, in such, an, such an interesting way, too. It's complicated. It's and complicated. as you say, against our better impulses, we do right. it anyway. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks.